This is, a Papa Doom film, illustrating the life cycle, of the silk moth. The silk moth, Bombyx mori, is a commercially important, domesticated insect. It is the domesticated form, of the original, wild, silk moth called Bombyx mandarina. Like all moths, its body is divided into three parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. The head, is the sensory center, it contains the compound eyes, which are made up of hundreds of tiny armatidia. Each of these little eyelets, has a cornea, a lens and a number of photoreceptor cells. Each little armatidium senses light, and color. The moth's brain integrates, all these tiny inputs to create, a version of, vision. The head also holds, a very elaborate pair of antennae, shaped almost, like feathers. These are olfactory organs, in other words, organs of smell. They are used mainly, to pick up the pheromones secreted by female moths. The ovipositor of the female, has sent glands that secrete the pheromone, bombicle, as soon as these glands are protruded, the male moth is inexorably attracted by sensing the pheromone with his antennae. When a male senses the tiniest hint of these special pheromones, the antennae help him to determine the direction from which they came. They do this by tracing the molecular concentration of the pheromones. The male moth can then follow the ever-increasing concentration of molecules until he gets to the female. Moth does not contain any mouthparts. Mouthparts are not needed because it does not ever eat during its lifetime. The next section of the body is the thorax. The thorax is the mobility center. Attached to the thorax are three pairs of legs with feet consisting of tiny hooks. These hooks help the moth to grip on surfaces such as mulberry leaves. There are also two pairs of wings attached to the thorax. Wild silk moths, Bombyx mandarina, may have to move considerable distances to find members of the opposite sex. That target may even be elsewhere in the same mulberry tree. The wild moths, therefore, need to have the ability to fly. In Bombyx mori, the domesticated moth, kept and nurtured in controlled spaces, flight is not necessary. As a result, they have over thousands of generations lost the ability to fly. Since the moth never eats or drinks in its lifetime, it has a finite, limited, package of energy. In Bombyx mori, the domesticated moth, this package of energy is now no longer wasted on flight, but it is available for use in reproduction. There is also, commonly, a clear difference in the wings of different sexes. Females hardly ever need to move fast, the males seek them out, and pursue them, so they, have poorly developed wings, and heavier bodies. The males often have to move fast to get to the female, before a rival male gets to her. For this, they use every resource, including wing flutter, to speed up. Male wings, are therefore, much more developed, even though the males are also, flightless. The last part of the moth's body is the abdomen. In most insects, the abdomen holds the digestive system, the excretory system, parts of the respiratory system, and the reproductive system. Since this moth does not take in any food, the alimentary canal has become rudimentary. However, the moth does move about, and it does carry out certain physical functions. It is because of these activities, that there are metabolic waste products. These waste products need to be excreted via a kidney-like organ. Every segment of the abdomen houses two small respiratory openings called spiracles. The spiracles are connected to a trachea that carries air and thus oxygen to all parts of the body. Most of the space in the abdomen of the silk moth is occupied by reproductive equipment. 
In the female, it is the ovaries with hundreds of eggs, and in the male, the testicles and seminal vesicles. The channels from these organs terminate, at the tip of the abdomen, into a cloacal structure. The cloacal openings of the male and female, have special gripping hooks on them, that allow them to be locked together for hours. When mating, or the passing of semen to the female has been completed, the male can voluntarily release the coupling and move on to another female. Notice the difference in abdominal size between male and female. Sperm cells are tiny when compared to eggs. Notice, also, the differences in wing development between the male, who needs to move fast over distances, and the female, who is more stationary in her behavior. Look carefully at the soft chitin cover between the segments in this female. See the bright yellow eggs shining through. Look on the lower part of the hairy segments and see the dimples where the respiratory spiracles open. Lastly, notice that the entire moth is covered in a kind of fur. These furry hairs are called setae and they serve to help the moth maintain an even body temperature by insulating it from cold and reflecting heat in its short, foodless and fuelless life. As we have said before, the silk moth does not eat or drink, not ever, in its entire life. We don't know if it actually ever sleeps. It seems to have only one purpose for its existence, that purpose is, procreation. For male moths, the purpose of life is to find, and mate with, as many females as possible. For females, the purpose of life is to get their eggs fertilized, and then to lay all those eggs, in a safe location. The ovipositor of the female, is used to feel around for a clear spot on which to deposit an egg. The bright yellow eggs have a sticky surface. This stickiness helps them to adhere to any surface upon which they are deposited. Each female will deposit 300 to 500 eggs, often she rotates as she does so, thus depositing her eggs in a circle. Fertilized eggs, slowly change from yellow to beige and then, darken to a dark blue-gray color, as the embryo develops. Unfertilized eggs remain yellow. The oval egg is approximately 1.5 millimeters in its long axis. With magnification and different lighting methods, one can vaguely see the outline of the tiny silkworm larva in the egg. What happens in the egg? and what happens when the little larva is hatching is yet to be filmed. The silkworm molts four times during its growth to adulthood. The term molt means to shed its skin. The skin is pliable, but not elastic enough to allow the larva to grow. Each time a skin is shed, there is a new, larger skin already made under the old one. You will recall that the silk moth was divided into three main parts, head, thorax, and abdomen. The silkworm has the same three parts. A head, the sensory center, for observing light, finding food, and taking that food into its digestive system. A thorax, the mobility center, to get to the food, find shelter, and move out of harm's way. A long, large abdomen, the food processing center, and the silk production center. This larval stage of the silk moth's life cycle has one main function. Its purpose in life is to do all the eating that this organism will ever require. We will now take a brief look at the details of the silkworm's structure and function. The image you see here is made by a scanning electron microscope. It shows the head of a silkworm. The image belongs to the science photo library. The head of the silkworm is seen from below, and at the very top of the image, we see the front end of the silkworm. The front end has many tactile sensory appendages, in the form of hair-like whiskers, protruding from its bulbous surface. Moving down the image, we see a maxillary plate with a central notch. 
This notch will help to guide the silkworm's cutting apparatus along the edge of a leaf. The leaf edge will fit into the notch, something like this. Immediately below the maxilla, there are two overlapping semi-mandibles that are designed to cut like scissors or like your own front teeth. The cutting edges of your top front teeth slide over the edges of your lower front teeth to cut through food. The mandibles of the silkworm do the same from side to side. In this case, the left one cuts over the right one. The silkworm uses these mandibles to cut off tiny bits of mulberry leaf. Positioned to the outside of each mandible, there is a special feeler that the silkworm uses to keep itself on track along the edge of the leaf. One feeler will run along the underside of the leaf, while the other feeler runs over the upper surface of the leaf. This keeps the leaf edge in the middle, where it can be sliced off by the mandibles. Lateral to, or on the outside of these guiding feelers, there are six dark dome-shaped structures. These are simple eyes. Unlike the compound eyes of the moth, these are single eyes, each with a lens and some light-sensing cells. These eyes are also called ocelli, and they do not provide vision, they simply sense light intensity. Getting back to the midline, below the mandibles there is a tongue-like structure with a microspiked surface. On either side of this structure, there is a feeler with a more heavily spiked inner surface. On either side of this feeler, there is a small articulated arm, called a pulp. It is easy to imagine how all these structures work together to shovel and push the leaf snippets that have been cut off by the mandibles backwards into the oral cavity. In the midline, behind the oral cavity, or below it in this image, there is a nozzle-shaped structure. This is the spinneret through which the silkworm will extrude and deliver its wonderful silk thread. The spinneret and the pulps can work together to lay down and place the silk in the pattern required by the silk moth larva, in other words, the silkworm. The dome of the head, containing all these essential parts, is mounted on the front of the thorax by a soft collar that provides considerable mobility. Notice how the head bobs as the leaf is cut, this means that the thorax can be kept still and stable while a section is completed. The thorax hosts three pairs of true legs. They are designed to grip towards the midline of the larva, thus holding it in position on the edge of the leaf where the best cutting and eating is done. The legs terminate in spiked claws. These claws have developed to give the best possible grip on mulberry leaves. Look at how well the three pairs of legs work together to maneuver the moa-like head along the edge of a leaf. Here we have a sketch of a silkworm, showing roughly its external and internal anatomy. Starting with the head, then the thorax with its three segments and three pairs of true legs, we come next to the abdomen. The abdomen consists of nine segments, and there are five pairs of pseudolegs. These false legs are called pseudopods, and they help to anchor and stabilize the heavy abdomen while the delicate work of eating is done. Abdominal segments 3, 4, 5, 6 and 9 each have a pair of pseudopods. Along the sides of the creature, there is a row of black dots. These are not really dots, they are small tubular openings called spiracles. The tubes leading from them are called tracheae. They transport air, with its oxygen, throughout the body. Running down the center of the body, from mouth to rectum, there is a long tube called the alimentary canal, shown in green in our sketch. It has the same function as our own gastrointestinal system, to process food and obtain energy and materials for growth, production and reproduction. On the surface of the alimentary canal, 
there is a system of Malpighian tubules, a kind of primitive kidney. The Malpighian tubules are depicted in purple. In the roof of the abdomen, or the dorsal area, there is a large dorsal blood vessel depicted in red. The blood of a silkworm is not red like our blood. Our blood is red because it needs to carry oxygen from the lungs to all parts of the body. The chemical compound, hemoglobin, that carries the oxygen in the blood of all our vertebrate cousins, gives blood its red color. The silkworm carries oxygen everywhere in its body, by means of the tracheal system. The purpose of a silkworm's blood is to move nutrients and chemicals around its body. To move the blood around, a pump is required. The dorsal vein acts as a pump by making peristaltic movements. These movements can, by careful observation, be seen through the skin of the silkworm. They are similar to our heartbeat. The rate of beats varies with temperature. In 1929, John H. Gerald published a paper in which he showed that the silkworm, the pupa, and the moth could sometimes reverse its blood flow by opposite peristalsis. Running along the lower or ventral part of the abdomen is the silk gland. In this gland, the silkworm produces and stores the liquid silk that it will need for its protective cocoon. Near the front end of the silk duct, there are two glands that open into the duct. They are the glands of Philippi or Lionet. Their purpose is unknown, but it is possible that they secrete a hardening agent into the silk just before it is extruded through the spinneret. The purpose of the silk is to make a cocoon, the cocoon is required for the next part of the life cycle. The central nervous system of the silkworm consists of a series of ganglia, or nerve cell nodules that run along the length of the body. There is a cerebral ganglion, or brain, in the head, three thoracic ganglia, and eight abdominal ganglia. These are all interconnected by nerve fibers, and they are also connected by nerve fibers, or axons, to all the different sensory organs such as ocelli, antennae and sensory hairs. The nervous system also controls all the motor functions such as carried out by the legs, pseudopods, mandibles and muscles that move the head. The sympathetic part of the nervous system controls digestion, respiration, peristalsis, and many other physiological functions. So, our silk moth larva is a complex creature, designed and adapted to eat and eat and eat so that it can store all the energy needed for the remainder of the life cycle. After the fourth molt, the larva is fully grown and will soon have stored all the energy and the silk that it needs for the next part of the journey through life. It finds a good spot and starts to lay down a silken scaffold in which to form and secure the cocoon. You may ask, why is a cocoon necessary? Well, the silkworm needs to go into a phase of life in which it has no legs, no mouth, and no means of evading predators. It has to do this in a mulberry tree. If it was not safely enclosed during this vulnerable time, it would simply fall out of the tree or be eaten by a bird. Of course, the cocoon, made out of the unique, light, smooth and strong material produced by this larva, is what has led to its domestication, cultivation, and protection over the past 3,000 years. For centuries, the vibrant colors, smooth textures, lightness, sheen, temperature regulation, and richness of the fabrics and carpets produced from this material has delighted their users, first in China and then on the rest of our planet. Measured silk threads unraveled from cocoons have shown that each larva produces approximately one kilometer of silk fiber. As the silkworm extrudes its silk, it steadily shrinks. When the cocoon is complete, the larva sheds its silkworm skin and becomes a gold-colored limbless, mouthless, sightless pupa with a shriveled package of silkworm skin next to it in the safe cocoon. Sometimes, when two silkworms choose the same area to start their cocoon building, they collaborate by building a single cocoon to house both of them together. These cocoons are usually a little larger than average. The pupa stays in the cocoon for approximately two weeks. 
Inside the pupil shell, a metamorphosis takes place. At the end of this process, the pupil shell is split open, and a fully developed silk moth emerges from the pupa. The moth excretes a jet of waste products that help it to dissolve the silk at the end of the cocoon. It then makes a hole in the softened silk and emerges into the open. The moth's first task is to get its wings and antennae unfurled, dried and stiffened. Female moths that are set upon by amorous waiting males frequently don't even get a chance to get themselves spruced up before being led up the garden path by the victorious male. And so, we have come full cycle through the life of this complex little creature, Bombyx mori, the silk moth. After thousands of years of using this strong, pliable fiber for creating beautiful fabrics, and after 150 years of using silk sutures in surgery, there are now many further developments in the use of this amazing material. Silken scaffolds are being used to act as substrates on which to grow living cells with the ultimate goal of producing replacement organs such as hearts and kidneys and livers all from the patient's own stem cells pressures on food sources are making scientists and farmers turn to the possibility of using insect protein to subsidize or substitute the animal and plant proteins we have all been consuming insects such as the silkworm are highly efficient at converting plant material into quality proteins and fats. Francois Dumini.